Hey everyone, this is Vantage Points, a series about seeking connection during the COVID-19 pandemic. We take time to check in with our friends in and around the coffee supply chain and talk through all the unique challenges we are facing as an industry. Today we are talking with our friends at Cafe Imports about setting competition aside, sharing information, and checking in on an emotional level with friends and colleagues across the industry. I've checked in with more people from other aspects of the industry and other companies in the past month and a half than in the past year. We're connecting back on a human level in ways that we weren't before because everyone was so busy. You know, it's like, okay, we're so busy, we're doing this, we're doing that. It's like, we're not busy now. Uh, not Certainly not as busy as we were. We speak quite frequently, but nowadays it's been more and more. And I think it's just words of comfort and encourage people to go on. Uh, what Noah also said, I think, is there's no time for competition right now. And in some cases, I've even checked in with other exporters that buy coffee from Costa Rica just to understand what they're going through. Um, so I would say being everybody playing the same game, it's, it's what we are doing right now. And then uh, it would be wonderful to hear from each of you one, who the heck are you? And uh, what you're doing within Cafe Imports, but also which communities are you're directly related to within Cafe Imports. Um, and that can really quickly lead into a conversation on how you're being affected and how those people are being affected. My name is Noah Namwitz. Uh, I work at Cafe Imports in Minneapolis. I've been uh, here for a little over 10 years. Uh, and I actually started in coffee at Cafe Imports kind of fresh out of college. Um, and so, yeah, my coffee career has been here, uh, but I work on the sales side. So I work with our U.S. team, our Europe team in Berlin, and then our Australian team in, in Melbourne kind of overseeing um, our company's sales. Hey, <laughs> um, I'm Everett Meister, and I am our... Uh, the director of education for Cafe Imports, and I'm also our editorial manager, which basically means I'm in charge of all of the content for the company. Um, so I do all outward facing and a lot of internal facing communications, uh, email blasts, and all of the text on our website, all of our individual coffee profiles, Instagram captions, um, things like that. That's all me. And then I teach classes and write curriculum both for staff and onboarding and, and just developmental stuff professionally. And then I do outward facing classes and run our education department. So, hey everyone, my name is Luis, but I go by, by Lucho. So you can all call me Lucho. Um, I've been working with Cafe Imports for five years now. Since the beginning, I started working on the team. And currently, I, well, I'm based in Guatemala, in, sorry, in Costa Rica, working in Costa Rica, and Nicaragua and Brazil. Those are the origins that I work. Costa Rica based because we have the exporting called Oxcar. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> can you guys hear me? It's yeah, a little bit in and out, but we can we can piece it together. Can you hear us? Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I think Bye. my Bye. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you as well. It's in and out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I think it's back now. Lucho and I well, have I don't the, know. Uh, the same birthday, same year. Oh, really? Yeah. What's your birthday? October 23rd. Okay. Hopefully you won't have a quarantine <laughs> birthday. There's so many people in ceremony who are like having quarantine birthdays. So yeah. hopefully we'll be out of it by then. <laughs> Wonderful. We're super excited to bring you all together because clearly Cafe Imports spans very largely across the globe. And when you're working from, from up top and then being a resource also for your own customers, they're coming to you saying, should I take this seriously or not? That communications or that burden becomes pretty large very quickly. And I guess a lot of a lot of the conversations we're having is just very obviously how are you affected, but also how are you showing up for those people as as a voice and as a leader of of the coffee industry. Um, and you all have very clear indicators, like my story. You're saying you know we're doing out 
outfacing communication, but also internal communications. Um, we're educators, but also we have a supply chain to take care of and producers to take care of. So however you want to jump in, it's fine. This is a conversation. We don't have to go around. Um, love to hear about your specific experiences of how, how you learned how to take this seriously and then quickly navigate to take care of the people that are in front of you. Well, I think that Noah might be frozen. Oh, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I was like, he's either like, yeah, he's, yes, yeah, he might have shut it off and went back on. And this was, I mean, I, otherwise, I was like, wow, I'm really impressed. Yeah. <laughs> we, we thought you were just holding very still for a really yeah. long time. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I just finished watching Jurassic Park again. Like, you know, you revisit it every couple of years just to make sure that it still uh -huh. holds up and yeah. it still holds up. But I was just like, okay. oh, maybe he's hiding from a T Rex. <laughs> no, I'm not quite sure if you if you heard the ask, but the ask was Cafe Imports has to support so many because you're a large organization and a large business from being a resource to roasters to being a resource to producers. And I guess, how did you navigate that leadership at a, a time of crisis? Yeah, I mean, it's really difficult. I mean, we, so we basically, like you had mentioned, I mean, our considerations basically span the whole supply chain. So from both the production level, the coffee farming level, all the way through the cafe service level. And so we both have to figure out how do we honor the commitments that we've made at Origin, you know, which is one of the, the biggest um, and most immediate consequences that I think that the coffee production world is facing right now is that, you know, people are unsure of if the coffees that they said they were going to buy, they still can roast and serve. Yeah. And so, um, you know, one was sort of detailing out a, a plan to see like for this specific project in this specific country, how do we get creative with a, you know, us getting to the point where we were, uh, willing to say and making a commitment that we we're going to buy everything that we said we were going to buy. I mean, that's just from day one. That was never really a question. But then the the follow up question to that is then, okay, how do we how do we sell it, right? How do we find the right homes for these coffees? And so on the sales side, um, for us, a lot of the roasters that we work with are are facing really uncertain times right now of not knowing where a specific coffee that they had intended to purchase is going to go. Um, and so what we're seeing a lot from the roasting partners is um, creativity with um, diversifying sales channels, really. I mean, it's so anywhere from literally hopping in an ice cream truck and, you know, driving around a neighborhood at seven in the morning with the music yeah. on and serving coffee out of AirPods to... Um, you know, maybe uh, approaching different grocery stores that they weren't currently working with. I mean, there's just, there's so many different avenues of, of creative sort of expansion, I guess, that uh, it's been really cool to see. Um, one of the things that we think about a lot and that we've been talking about a lot is like, we are not able to engage with our customers right now in the way that we normally do, you know, and so we're, we're on the road a lot. Mm -hmm. interacting with people like you know earlier or last year I went, I went out and visited Ashley and in Baltimore and it's like we're not able to do that stuff and so we're also not able to share a lot of the things we're hearing from different customers of like hey this worked or they someone tried this and it didn't work and so a lot of the conversations we're having now is like how do we continue to foster those conversations so that a roaster in an area that's maybe not as well connected as say a major city can still hear that, oh, roaster in New York City tried this and it really worked for them. Um, uh, because right now you as a company can either shut down and sort of just kind of cut your losses and figure out, okay, how are we gonna just weather this until it's gone? Or, or you can you know, try to figure out if there's a way to get creative and keep people working. And I think that those are really the two choices companies have right now. Yeah, as far as uh, on the producer side, what kind of questions are they coming to an importer with? Is it mostly how, how is the support and the contracting going to operate? Or are they coming to imports, importers, especially out of the US who have seen most crisis? Um, I know in Uganda, cases are low but they're seeing us all kind of disperse and go back home and deal with a crisis and asking, uh, how are you keeping people safe? 
Yeah, um, I mean, I think Lucho could probably answer the the producer side. I mean, from the technical or I guess like the the trading side, what we're seeing is that um, essentially coffee that's here now is is more expensive. So the coffee trades on the C market, uh, and so it's not quite there. But what's happening is what's called a market inversion, which basically means that coffee out in the future is actually less expensive than coffee that's here right now. And so the market is kind of trending that way. It hasn't yeah. happened yet, but basically what that's saying is that the marketplace is placing more value on what's in hand right now, just due to uncertainty in the future. Um, and so that causes a lot of issues because basically then what can happen is that people, mostly large commercial um, importers or commercial roasters can hoard coffee because they're like, I don't know what my coffee is going to cost in December. So I'm going to just buy everything now and just store it. And what happens is that creates a shortage, right? So then mm -hmm. supply and demand, if supply is down, prices go up. And so there's a lot of variables there that impacts pricing. And maybe not directly with the, the main volume of coffee that we do, which is insulated a little bit from the sea market, uh, but it does have ripple effects into the quality of the types of coffees that we, that we purchase and, and we sell. Um, but yeah, Lucha, I'll let you share kind of what you're hearing on the farm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I've seen multiple responses from like from the countries that I work. Uh, for example, Costa Rica, when everything began, the producers were they were not concerned. They they were thinking this was just a situation that it was going to pass in a couple of days, and things were going to get back to the normal in a matter of days. So starting in that position, there were a lot of offers from producers speaking in micro lot levels that they were still tendering samples to multiple companies and in a moment like this i think the best or the safest bet was to go with the partner you work with and try to lock those those coffees mm -hmm. so us as a company we didn't we continue buying the coffees that we had committed to buy but there's always room to more coffees to buy but if the producers were tendering these samples somewhere else, expecting higher prices, then our window of buying may, might be reduced, and then they were not able to sell somewhere else. Right. So what I've been seeing in Costa Rica, the most affected, unfortunately, is the micro lab producers. Those producers who are wanting to sell their coffees at higher prices. As like what commercial coffees, I don't think there has been any negative impact in terms of sourcing. There's still coffee going out in like I would say normal basis, but in the high-end coffees or expensive coffees, there's been a slowdown in the days that has been passing by. So I think being now the producers understanding the situation where the markets are really affected, they are now understanding that is the moment to readapt their strategies. So which is good because they are the strategy at the moment is try to sell the coffees at a fair price where they can win, where everybody can win and we can all share risk because we cannot buy a coffee that costs, let's say, $1,000. No one will buy it at the moment, but we could buy more volume of a lower price coffee at a high end coffee and hoping for next year that we can continue or recover the volumes that we used to buy. So I would say Costa Rica is a very typical country when it comes for micro lots, because it's it's a different world compared to what I see, for example, in Nicaragua, mm -hmm. which the other countries that I work, the Nicaraguans are not that concerned because they are used to sell coffees at a lower price. Mm -hmm. So those coffees are being sold and they are going out and they're moving. There's no lack of coffee, shortage of containers. We've been seeing some affectation in the logistics but not in coffee so nicaragua i would say they're more okay or they will be more okay in terms of selling their coffees and the other country that i work is brazil brazil some regions are just starting their harvest or the early pickings so they i would say they are not concerned because the, no matter what they will be able to sell their coffees we will still focus on doing our projects but overall, the same question that they have, I think, every, all the producer is what is going to happen in the U.S. Because at the end, that's the biggest market we sell. And that's where we've seen a lot of cost, unfortunate customers shutting down. 
So uncertainty is is the feeling I would say in the air. Um, and pricing that is the main the main reason. But as Noah was saying, we haven't we haven't default any contracts that we have, so that gives a lot of uh, positive thoughts to producers that they can continue doing what they do. And we need to refocus on on strategies like quality wise pricing structures in order to share risk because this is an, an unusual situation that I've never faced something like this. I I don't have an answer for producers to say what's going to happen next week. The only thing that we can do is try to be everyone on the same boat and transfer those risks between all of us because I think that's the only way that we can continue buying the coffees and the good thing is some producers, they already know they won't be making a lot of money, but they want to break even so they can invest back to the farms or, or buy fertilizers. Because I think that's my, well, that's my biggest concern. If we don't buy coffee today, the next year is what will be the situation. It's not today, it's, it's long term. So I don't know if I go back, I went all, all over the places. <laughs> No, I think I think what you shared was really important, oh, especially the risk sharing part of it. I think that's why we're all here is to like mm -hmm. represent different parts of the supply chain and get that message out and yeah, be like, how can we help each other? What are you facing and how can we help each other? So that risk sharing is huge. But I mean, one other thing too that, that Lucho mentioned is that, you know, obviously the mic folks that are primarily producing micro lots are, are particularly infected right now. And, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that people aren't traveling either. Um, so, you know, a roaster in a specific city that may normally travel to Costa Rica and literally select lots off the table is not doing that anymore. Um, right. And so because that travel isn't happening, a lot of times those coffees are, it's uncertain where their home is, you know? And so that's where companies like Cafe Imports or, other um, progressive importing companies that can sort of absorb some of that risk, you know, it's really our duty to try to find good homes for those coffees, especially in light of access being restricted like it is right now. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, I'm interested to hear um, Ever's perspective because she's done a lot of work on the on um, coffee transparency and, and the transparency guide and just figuring out how does this current pandemic um, affect you know, how, how folks will, will report information for 2020. I mean, because a lot of that, a lot of that access may not be there this year, um, just based off of how people are going to be forced to purchase coffee. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear that. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, in the kind of communications that we do, um, it's a very delicate time because, you know, like Noah's saying, and like Lucho's saying, we're really sort of trying to bridge the gap between buyers who have suddenly not only lost access to producers and communications that they have had more directly um, through visits and through those kinds of relationships, but also buyers who are suddenly looking at their books going, I mean, can I sell what I have? And mm -hmm. how am I going to be able to make predictions about what I can book two or three months out, six months out? Um, people are really evaluating the relationships that they've built and the ways that those relationships have been maintained. So it's a really delicate time to know that in order that to keep the industry sustainable and in order to keep the momentum of the good that work that we've done, um, we have to sell coffee. Like someone has to be buying coffee. And now the question is, how do we reframe the ways that we buy coffee and the coffees that we buy so that we can all continue to do the work that we need to do to keep being progressive? You know, the conversation two months ago was almost entirely, how do we get producers more money? Mm -hmm. And now the question is, where does that money come from if no one at the retail or wholesale end is able to make their own margins? So it becomes a very interesting um, kind of, Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of situation, which is very difficult to communicate because it's very sensitive. People are, are very emotionally, you know, sort of tender about how much they're able to do. Everyone's afraid for their staffs and for their families. 
Um, and so it's become a really interesting conundrum of how do you communicate? Like we still have coffees to sell and we still have relationships that we're maintaining. We're honoring all of our contracts. We're going to have all of our inventory without sounding like you're not being sensitive to the fact that people are, are really in a, a very tenuous place about what they can spend and how much they can buy. So it will be a really interesting year in terms of continuing conversations. I think it's absolutely a time when a, 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 like we have to make ourselves vulnerable and say, look, we are in this together and we need to help each other. And how can we help you? And how can we help each other? Um, we have to, I think as an industry, um, we have to put competition aside a little bit at this moment um, in terms of, of really working together to build up the foundation of the of specialty coffee in general. And that's a really, it's, it's not a difficult thing to do on a personal level. Like, you know, we all hang out at SCA. We all kind of like yeah. each other really. But when it comes to business, when you're talking to people who are already in a vulnerable, vulnerable position, it can be tricky to, um, want to innovate together. So I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the ways that people are reaching out to each other, the, the kind of, maybe some of the kind of buying that we could be doing, you know, or be, or we can sort of establish systems for roasters to, um, to buy slightly differently so that they can, again, like mitigate some of their risk, but also join in sharing risk in the supply chain. Um, but generally speaking, it's also just been a difficult time to know, like, when do you start posting pictures of coffee again mm -hmm. and telling the kinds of stories that we were telling, you know, who's, where is everyone at? Like, how do you take a temperature of an industry that's, that's in a position like this where we, none of us have ever been in this position before. Um, so it's been really interesting in that sense. And in terms of the, transparency and the transaction guide and all of the work that we've been doing in terms of like really kind of lifting the producer's voice and making sure that producers are earning more money. I think it's really going to, I mean, I hate to say time will tell because it's such an unsatisfying <laughs> answer. Um, but I really have no idea what a lot of the companies that are pushing that conversation forward will do because everything has changed seemingly overnight. Um, who knows what will happen to the cost of production? Um, you know, all the research mm -hmm. that everyone's been doing into cost of production and, and the cost of living has instantly changed worldwide. And that's astounding. Who knows how, I mean, people can't buy soap in the grocery store. Can people buy fertilizer in six months? You know, it's, it's really wild. So, I think you know the best thing to do is to to be as upfront and honest as possible, um, and we're really trying to do that and trying to really show the humanity behind the, what everyone's going through and and offer as much grace as possible and toe that very delicate line. I mean, vulnerability too. I mean, that's one thing that I I've I've been thinking a lot about that you know, those of us that are fortunate enough to still be working right now that, mm -hmm. you know, obviously our daily expenses are reduced, most of us, because we're home, you know, it's like, I, I haven't filled up my car in for, with gas for like, whatever, a month or something. Um, but I think that like, you know, coffee, the coffee industry is unique in the sense that like, people genuinely want to help, you know, and like, um, you know, uh, I'll just use the example, like ever you sent me this link of like this cool little candy company in New York that like, you know, had said like, hey, we, you know, we're, we've fallen on hard times and like we're trying to sell these boxes of candy and like I, I bought a box of candy because it's like I have two young kids here and like, you know, I normally probably wouldn't buy candy online or whatever, but like I did that because A, I wanted to help them out, but also too, it was like, okay, cool, we're here at home and like, I think that figuring out how to make it really easy for people to help, like that's the one of the biggest challenges right now because, you know, people are sort of sitting around, like like Ever was saying, like wanting to do something. And so there have been some companies that we've seen that have made it really easy and have also been really honest about like where they're at. 
And, and I feel like calling to our customers and to roasting, roasting customers and saying like, here's how you can support us um, is, a, is a good move right now because people want to help, you know, and people want to be able to have nice, small luxuries at home right now in a time that's pretty unfun. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, one of the things that we hope to do through this really quick project is that we called it an emotional check-in because this is such a vulnerable time. Um, we have within our production team, three people working in different segments of this industry with very unique emotional challenges because we're isolated. Um, and you all can express the same concern of like, how do I export and mill and do quality by my iPhone <laughs> on the other side of the world? Um, how do I, you know, I'm supposed to be on the road right now uh, doing cuppings with different people. And how do I create an experience for people who are also just like, hey, I just had to lay off my, my work family. You know, the, the vulnerabilities are very different now and they're very raw. And the only way that we can share the risk and understand the risk is knowing and doing this emotional check-in. Like, what are you most like disturbed by right now? <laughs> like what, what truly is on your heart? And um, so we not only are asking, how are you affected? But like everybody has flipped their businesses on their heads, like their business models in like the matter of a day, which is so resilient and impressive. And you know, coming from a, a developmental nonprofit point of view, you you look at resiliency of a people and you know, people are damn resilient in this industry. And it's so impressive and so inspiring. And I think we can learn from each other of how we flipped like the entrepreneurs uh, like Lane Harlan in Baltimore flipping her award winning restaurants on its head and doing it with this little possible people and returning that value back to her fit, her restaurant families. It's, it's impressive and it's awe inspiring, not only in time of crisis. So I guess like the three of you are representing very unique vantage points of, of your one company and how have you seen people thrive in yourself, but also those people that you represent? Well, <laughs> um, I will say that, you know, uh, I mean, I already spend more time probably than anyone in the company on social media anyway, because it's kind of my job. Um, but I will say that watching the mm -hmm. community come together in a kind of a grassroots kind of a way to say like, let's have, let's have coffee breaks. Let, you know, I've, t I've checked in with more people from other aspects of the industry and other companies in the past month and a half than in the past year, because we all wait for expo basically yeah. to like catch up, which by the way is a terrible idea because there's no time. <laughs> um, yeah. But I have had so many uh, mornings that were like someone just saying, Hey, do you want to FaceTime over coffee this morning and just talk about what's going on or having roasters reach out to us on Instagram, having the time and the energy to really engage with our customers and ask them questions through the channels that we have online and really thinking about the ways that folks are doing things like this, record, like recording a Zoom call. It's so much easier than setting up an event where you have to have uh, invitations and you have to get a space yeah. and you have to get snacks for everybody. Um, and it offers this immediate access to people in a real way. So it really creates a connectivity that I think reinforces the strength of the bonds that we have as an industry and the bonds that we have as individual partners in the industry. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was thinking about, I have been thinking Noah about how, um, you know, we, we really love visiting customers. Like there's nothing better than walking into somebody's roastery and seeing a cafe imports bag or, you know, having a cup of coffee and really talking about the relationship that you've built over that coffee. But this is also, such a good temporary replacement this ability to be in touch with anyone at any time um, is really remarkable it's a little bit different obviously but i mean i'll take it over nothing for sure so that that has been really heartening to me the ways that people have really reached out and stepped up um, just in making again the personal connection with coffee which is what like what most of us really love about coffee anyway is that 
personal connection that we have with it. So, um, in my case, what I've seen is a lot of solidarity. Um, well, most of my the people that I work, we are all in lockdowns and we're working from their meals or their houses. So, communication. I think. Well, throughout the harvest season, we speak quite frequently, but nowadays it's been more and more. And I think it's just words of comfort and encourage people to go on. And so it's not about being uh, in front of each other, but I think it's sharing uh, information, sharing insights. Uh, what Noah also said, I think is there's no time for competition right now. And in some cases I've even checked in with other exporters that buy coffee from Costa Rica just to understand what they're going through. Um, so I would say being everybody playing the same game, it's, it's what we are doing right now. And yeah, sharing insights, information. And at the end of the day, I think support just because we, no one knew what was going to happen next week. So as long as we all be supportive to each other, I think we can have a positive feeling. And I think that's, and I can translate that into the same Guatemala. I don't work much in Guatemala, but I, I have some friends in different multiple industries and we are all just like sharing insights, inputs. And yeah, I think that's what we, I think we've been trying to do down here. Yeah. And I mean, I guess on the, on the, um, cafe or, or coffee roasting side, I mean, I sort of alluded to some of the things that, that, that we've seen, but I mean, I um, have a customer in Santa Barbara that they um, have reduced hours, you know, obviously at their shop, but they're delivering, you know, they're delivering coffee and pastries. So like someone will put in an order, they've like overnight basically implemented the system. And then the owners of this company, Todd and Julia are literally driving in their car and driving around <laughs> coffee to people in, in Santa Barbara. And, um, you know, I think that sort of like was said earlier, I mean, you know, I don't think anyone's goal this year is to make money. I think everyone's goal this year is to just get by, right? Mm -hmm. And like, that's, survive. you know, sur survive. And that's certainly true for us. And I think that that's sort of what the, the mindset of, um, you know, being of service to others is really, it's like one of those things in, in life that, and it's true, you know, for in, in every interaction that it's like when you're able to give yourself freely to others is when you get the most in return. And I think kind of like having the initial reaction right now of survival instinct of like, I need to collect everything for myself and like protect myself and my family. And you sort of are, it's really easy for me personally to want to sort of go into that space and, and be very introverted and just like sort of self-protective. But really, those are the times when people are most unhappy. And it's like when we're able to sort of give ourselves really to others and be a service to others and share information, that's really when we, I think, as, a, as hum, humanity is our happiest. And so um, that's really kind of what I think one of the benefits of this whole terrible situation is, like Meister was saying, is that like we're connecting back on a human level in ways that we weren't before because everyone was so busy you know it's like okay we're so busy we're doing this we're doing that it's like we're not busy now uh not certainly not as busy as we were uh but we're getting creative i think in how we engage with, with one another which is um which has been heartening to see i think i think a common thread we've been hearing is that like people are it's shedding light onto yeah you know, things that they can do better and so for us at ceremony one of those things was engaging with our customers so it's been interesting to see the the weaknesses of our e-commerce platform like what we aren't being able to deliver and having to figure out how to do that but then also the same way you guys are like we're getting feedback from customers in so many ways. And then we have me and the head roaster and our trainer and one of our techs like jumping in to answer all of these questions. And so it's so small, but it's also very empowering to be like, oh, someone has a question for us. Like, and yeah, you can like engage on a personal level of one weird one where I was like, no, don't brew with distilled water. Like, I don't know who told you that, but like was okay. able to through many emails back and forth, figure out what was going on with their coffee. But I also like wanted to one more thing is to shed some like personal buying experience onto exactly the situation Noah and Lucho said of um, 
we've adapted, we found new markets, but it's mostly our blends that are going out. So I've been able to keep my contacts with Cafe Imports specifically on containers of blend components that we have coming in, but it is those micro lots that I've had to step back on and not commit to as much and only work with partners we've worked with in the past and in actually Lucho Costa Rica specifically buy less than, than they wanted me to because that is an expensive origin. And so I had to be like, I can only commit to one lot this year, not three. And so that was just some personal anecdote from ceremony. And as a buyer, that basically reinforces everything you guys said here about pricing and what people are buying and, and then like adapting to that change. Yeah. And I guess just to sort of add to that, I mean, from a buying perspective too, it's sort of like Lucha was saying that, you know, coffee farmers are understanding that they don't have the luxury of just sitting back and waiting for so-and-so to come visit and buy this expensive micro lot. And so part of our responsibility um, as a, you know, as a more progressive importer is trying to figure out like, okay, maybe we won't be able to sell all these coffees or purchase all these coffees as micro lots this year. But what if we take, say, this selection of coffees and blend them together at potentially a lower price, which obviously is not ideal for anybody, but maybe it will help move that coffee as opposed to it just sitting, you know, in, in Costa Rica. And so us kind of figuring out how do we diversify our buying plan from maybe going from, absorbing potentially excess coffee that we weren't planning on buying but would have been available and super delicious and we want to buy um, and figuring out like okay maybe we can purchase this in a different way and still help mm -hmm. find a good home for it that is again sort of part of that not ideal scenario for anybody but it's at least finding you know somewhat of a good home for those coffees as opposed to them going to waste yeah i have um i had um experienced last week actually from a producer that we work for five, six years now. And um, his name is Jonathan Camacho. Every year he sells us like 50 or 60 bags. And this year he's one of the latest producers who tender samples because he's in the West Valley, coffees come late. But so he tendered the samples the other day, coffees were good, but they were, the expected price was very high to the current market. And because of all the situations, all the complications that, that are coming. So he started the conversation saying, look, I don't want to make money, but I just want, I need cash because I need to cover my expenses. I need to figure out a price that you can buy the off for me and I can sell. So we're in between this conversation of, okay, let's buy the coffee at a price. And if we are able to sell at a higher price, we can pay you back or we can pay you a premium. So again, like sharing risk, open conversations. But if we were just straight, no, we would have, lost the coffee, he would have lost the sale and this, the cycle just extends. So yes, yeah, like, I think it's the time to open conversations and, and we probably won't make money out of that coffee, but we will still bring that coffee. And, but yeah, I think that's, I think that in Costa Rica, it's like you said, Ashley, it's one of the hardest countries when it comes for micro lots because prices just are high. Quality is also high, but prices sometimes are way too high. Mm -hmm. for for the current market yeah and i mean and that's not losing that coffee just for this year you know i mean we've we've been around for 25 years and so these are relationships that we've established over decades and so yeah. Yeah. us us making the wrong decision now because of um you know for fiscal reasons will have impact for us for for years to come because we of course, would love to be in business next year still and um, continue back up, you know, sort of where we left off. And so our, us protecting those relationships, both with the producers we work with and then also the roasters we work with. I mean, you know, everyone's in tough financial position right now. So figuring out financially, you know, how we can work with roasters to um, to make ends meet, you know, and, and not sort of be the... Um, I guess the like, you know, heavy handed debt collector right now, which is, um, which is a tough position. You know, the most of our customers are in of, of having trouble just, just making ends meet and paying the bills. And so um, figuring out how to share risk on that level too is, is really important for us to, to help people get by. It's in our interest for everyone to stay in business. Mm -hmm. I think the, another theme that we've been hearing a lot, it's a, the partnership. So it's like they're resharing the risk, but we're all in like a partnership. So like you were saying, keeping your relationships, it's the same at ceremony. I'm trying to keep those relationships we've had, do what I can, commit to those promises and just, yeah, to be honest and transparent with each other. 
We had an interesting question from another importer yesterday who was wondering about, um, shout out to Jake at Crop to Cup, but he was wondering about a uh, storage bottleneck and like what other people are thinking about that in the future, that he sees that on the horizon. And then interestingly, that me, that was something I never thought of. I was like, oh, right. Like that's going to be an issue. <laughs> I was like, we were supposed to be expanding our warehouse too. And now that's put on hold. So I don't know if you guys have thought about that at all. Um, I guess yeah. either in origin and here in the States about people buying less, all the coffees coming in. For sure. I mean, so one of the, one of the, um, so can, we, we own and operate our own warehouse in Minneapolis. And so we have space, uh, fortunately, um, to store coffee here. And, and then we also, you know, store people's positions in, in peripheral warehouses as well. Um, there will be for sure a slowdown in people pulling coffee and there already is now. And so you're starting to see, you know, maybe inventory that would turn every three months or something like that is, is definitely going to be extended out. Um, the biggest impact there, I wouldn't say necessarily is like physical space, but is financial space. So financial capacity. So uh, for importers or roasters to have to essentially carry coffee for a longer period of time is expensive uh, just because, you know, every bag takes up a certain square footage in the warehouse and that needs to be paid for. And so, um, those are in the industry, those are called carry costs. And so it's like the cost both to finance the coffee because the money went out and you're paying interest on your line of credit. Um, and then also the physical cost to store the coffee. So to keep the lights on and pay the warehouse workers. And so those costs do increase as you store coffee. And that, that is something that we're, we're anticipating for sure. We're trying to be as inclusive as possible in our, our gas lineup. And, um, one of the groups that we're interviewing or segments of the industry is the nonprofits. And I know from my own organization, we have people like Rick Pizer, uh, who really focuses on hunger in the coffee lands and just different, different ways within a, a development lens to care for producers. Um, and the main theme of this whole Corona talk is uncertainty. Like I'm trying to track, uh, keep track of keywords like delicate situation, uncertainty, um, needing commitment, like these, these themes throughout. But I'm curious as an organization that spans across the world, like what are you most fearful about that? Like, you know, Jake spoke about, um, you know, storage bottleneck and that came to mind as an importer. But um, I, I spoke about how, you know, we, have to think about this. this this is a crisis not just now the the pain that we're going to feel in Uganda will be next year <laughs> you know that's where where I'm I go to um, is there s something that your brain goes to that you think like maybe a year from now we're going to be worried about hunger in this country or we're going to be worried about you know Australia for this reason is there something that you know, we on in different segments of the industry just wouldn't see because we're not in that nook of the world. <laughs> it's a, you know, a very Sorry. blank I question, can, but. No, I can share one that actually probably isn't on most people's radar. I have unique perspective on just because of our office in Australia um, is that their currency um, at the same time that all this happens, um, their currency is also extremely devalued to the dollar. So they're at like 0.61 Australian dollars for every one US dollar. Um, and so in addition to all the economic insecurity that people are facing and cafes having to close and everything else that's happening in the world, their coffee is significantly more expensive than it was. And so when we first opened up our Australian office, it was the Australian dollar was 1.1 to 1 US dollar. And now it's 0.61. So, I mean, that is a gigantic shift where because coffee is bought and sold in dollars, um, Australia is really in a precarious position because the fact that they um, are, are having huge financial hits because of their because of the currency. So um, that's something that I think um, for that country specifically is going to be a huge challenge moving forward, um, especially if the sea market continues to rally. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I was also, I don't know if this has happened yet, but I was thinking as countries are in different parts of their harvests, Brazil getting ready to start, Colombia getting ready to start um, their fly crop, you were saying you've been able to keep most of your contracts intact. Have you seen anyone who 
hasn't been able to, like any country or any particular like farm or state who hasn't been able to process their coffee or have the workers or who have been affected by COVID in that way? I, I have had some news regarding Brazilians that they are already anticipating a shortage of labor, uh, people going picking um, because restrictions traveling within Brazil might probably will extend. So there, there probably will be a shortage of people able to travel and do labor uh, during the harvest. Um, that's what I've seen in, in, in Brazil. In Central America, I haven't had that situation, or at least I haven't heard from that situation. But also, Central America is towards the end of the harvest, so I don't think that's an issue. Um, but yeah, I think travel restrictions is going to be a challenge in Colombia as well. What, what we've heard from Jairo, Colombia was in a completely lockdown. People were not or, we, or wanting to go somewhere else. So, and in Colombia, where people pickers travel from department to department. So I think that will probably get, will affect, maybe not significantly, but it will decrease the high-end coffees by a margin, I guess. And then I guess my last question based off of, I guess, a reduction in things. Are you trying, are you worried at all about having workers at the mill in Central America? Like, are you trying to get everything milled now and get it out? Or is it more of like, it'll be okay to keep it in parchment and wait and see and ship it out later in the year, like in, in different segments like would normally happen? I think, well, we had a, I know our, one of the exporters we worked with in here in Guatemala, two weeks ago, they completely shut down their factory. Not because they needed to, but they, because they wanted to implement new security protocols. So they completely closed for a week in order to implement and train everyone on board. Uh, but after that week, they, but their, their goal is to ship everything as soon as possible. Because also going back what Noah said at the beginning, everybody wants to have the coffee in-house now. So everybody's trying to ship coffees fast. Um, I think, yes, people who didn't sell in at origin coffees, let's say by now, they probably will have a slowdown in their exports in the, in the next two, three months. But everything that was purchased from January till today, I think those coffees will go out quite fast. And, mm-hmm. and that's something that we experienced in Uganda, just a... No, Sorry, go, Ashley. Go, no, no, go, go. Um, that's something we experienced in Uganda, for sure. And um, just the fear, one, we had uh, the president completely shut the, down the country in day one. And then the second day, the government itself didn't know how to respond to that shutdown. So we would have maybe freighting companies that could move, but um, nobody could use private or public transportation. So you have a truck, but no driver. You know, and that's that's what we're experiencing in Uganda and having to ask like, well, this is a, can we get an, ex, an exemption letter or a sticker and the government not even knowing what that would look like. Um, so again, just the uncertainty. Um, do we mail everything now or do we keep it in parchment? What will that mean for quality? And just that uncertainty is, is definitely what at least we're navigating for sure. Bouncing back to you, Ashley. Oh, yeah, I mean, just based off that, that's why talking to you when you returned and talking to like Noah and my other importers, that's why I wanted to have this conversation is because like everybody's experiencing something different in different countries. And so to me, getting that information out was just very, very interesting. And those challenges that we wouldn't think of because we're not there and what that means for the future. But um, my, my, I guess I think my last question right now is we talked a little bit about transparency and all of us communicating and how we can really support cafe imports in that way. Do the three of you have other asks of the supply chain of how we can support you right now? I think, if I may, yes. <laughs> um, I, one of the things, and this ties into the previous question too, I think one of the things that I'm maybe the most worried about is the six month or eight month progression when um, people are really anxious to get back to the way that things were before this situation. And uh, I'm a little bit afraid that uh, unless we are really intentional about it, um, 
we will wind up in a, in a changed world with expectations that relate to the way that things used to be. Um, and I, I, I think that there are a lot of ways in which we will go back to normal, normal. Um, I haven't, I've never been normal. I've never had a more normal day in my life. So I have no idea what that means, but you know, like the way that things have operated so far, but I do think that there's a lot of expectations in specialty coffee specifically that we'll need to really evaluate in terms of, again, like we're talking about the micro lots that we'll have access to, um, the quality that producers will be able to maintain next year based on, you know, a year's worth of limited resources and limited access to market. Um, in terms of traceability and transparency, the, the fact that we don't have as much interaction with or interface with producers will really limit the access we have to information. Um, and information is already difficult to gather in a lot of these cases because often farmers are so remote that once they drop their coffee off, if that coffee scores very, of, you know, if it achieves a really high score, then the exporter or whoever is trying to track down traceability has to go find them you know, who knows how long it takes. So, it, it, and right now, no one's traveling at all. Communication can be really difficult for folks in really remote areas with limited access. So we're really thinking about the ways that we tell the story of coffee, the ways that we buy coffee based on story, based on expectations of quality. Those things may have to change um, and adapt, or at least we can reevaluate the value that we place on them and, you know, go into the next year, two years, five years, who knows how long, um, with a little bit of grace for what's available and what everyone is going through and not maybe um, be so hyper-focused on the things that we have come to expect and feel entitled to in the past. Because I don't know if, if those things will be quite as robust as they may be, have been for us. It's really well said. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess for me, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I think expectations, like ever said, is, is a big one, you know, of just that, of, of what, what can be expected during these times. You know, a good example is like, um, in normal times when we would maybe be able to have one of our export partners go down and gather some certain level of information that we maybe don't have access to, like that, that just might not be possible right now. And so that expectation of like, uh, what type and amount of information it, we're able to gather for, for each coffee, I think is a big one, just because it, it may be limited. It may not in, in some instances, especially places that we have, you know, previous relationships with. But if we're doing everything we can to, um, you know, pay the best price for a specific micro lot, but maybe we've actually never shook hands with this farmer before, um, that those are the types of things where it's like, what, what, our ability to get that stuff might be limited. Um, you know, I think that the other thing that I think a lot about is, um, I think most people in, in hospitality have heard of or maybe read the, that book, Setting the Table, um, Danny Meyer, and uh, it's, a, it's a good one. But he talks a lot about like the stakeholder cycle. And so um, if you ba basically like the concept is that like if you're not taking care of like yourself, your employees, your community, the external stakeholders in your company that like the whole thing falls apart. And so I think that like the biggest thing is having that holistic attitude of like, we have to take care of everyone that touches this company or else like the company doesn't work. And so I think continuing to have that sort of global mindset and remembering what's important for, for individual companies and not maybe sacrificing um, some of the things that make each individual roastery super great and unique, um, even in during in trying times, it's incredibly important because uh, in order for us to continue to do the good we want to do, we need roasters to still care about the stuff that they cared about before this. You know, and so um, so it's our hope that that you know that financial means don't mean sacrificing the things that basically keep us in business in my my opinion well i think everybody will continue consuming coffee well in my experience for example here where we're locked down me and my girlfriend we haven't stopped buying coffee from local roasters or and i think it it will continue like being like that and be honest, if we have to save money, we wouldn't probably buy a micro lot, but we will buy the same coffee from that producer at a price that it works for the producer, for the importer, and for the roasters. 
So I think that transparency and pricing, it's going to be a key factor in the future where, because yes, there's producers that because they have a certain variety, they expect a way high price. And that's a, I think we, I wouldn't buy a high price coffee right now when I can buy more coffee at a lower price, but I can buy more volume. So I think it's going to be that dynamics of being able to have a price that serves the roaster, the producer, but allow us to buy more volume. And the help that we can get from you is can try keep consuming or buying the coffees. And I think it's economics at the end. It's not consumption. It's it's a matter of how we can all be in the same in the same line. Mm. So yeah, that's what I would say, the support that I think and the producers also would need. Do you have any questions for us or any of our guests going forward, things that you guys would want answers to or what's on your mind? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, we're having, I mean, we're, we're having so many of these conversations every day, both mm -hmm. internally and externally that it's like, um, you know, it's, yeah. I, I don't think there's anything we didn't cover today that's like really um, weighing on weighing on my mind that um, that we haven't already discussed, you know, in some way. Nico, do you have anything else you want to add? No, I just want to thank you all for taking an hour out of your days. I I know like it, we feel very still, but I don't think we're stopping being busy. Like <laughs> we're filling oh, our yeah. time. So. I mean, I, it's crazy over here. So I expect it to be the same for you. Um, so thank you for sharing your time um, mm. to reflect with us and to share with everybody your experiences. I, I, had, a, I had a friend that uh, was, I was talking to yesterday that owns a coffee roastery and he was saying that the universe works in really mysterious ways because like <laughs> just like three or four months ago, they were having a you know, a business meeting and a conversation and they kept saying the line like, oh, coffee is recession proof, you know, like coffee is recession proof. And so like, this is the, <laughs> this is the, uh, the universe's way of saying like, listen, you're not above this either. So. Yeah. Oh my God. Did they say it three <laughs> times into a mirror? Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> they, the, they pulled a candy man. Yeah. Well, hey, how many is this? It's their fault. No, I'm just <laughs> you know, like, I'm, I'm constantly, I'm definitely from the business world of coffee and I'm now being pulled into meeting rooms with nonprofit people asking for the, the indicator of social enterprise, like trust. Okay, well, how do you measure that? And through these conversations, like this is really being tested. And that's one of the reasons why I'm keeping this, this chart of keywords, but it's, it's risk sharing, it's communication, but how do you measure that? Um, and it kind of circles back like, it is economics. It really is, um, and and I don't know. It's just uh, I'm thankful for this platform, whatever these conversations are, um, because it's reinforcing. I think why all of us are in this business, and it is economics, and it is consumerism, it is supply and um, and demand. But it goes back to the why, and we're in it because we care about people. So I hope that reinforces it um, and reinforces why we're. We, we all care about products because it allows us to show intentionality to people. Um, and yeah, so I'm enjoying these conversations. And again, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. This was really wonderful. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Nice to see you. Bye.